All right. I'm gonna start this. I'm gonna let it rip. Let it rip, Dom. Yeah. I am letting it rip because we've just let all our Zoom audience in. Hello, Zoom people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and hello to all the people who are not Zoomers as well. Um, this is our very first event for the year. Um, if you had asked me two weeks ago if we would have events this year, I would have gone, meh. But um, it seems that we are. So I'm very excited to be kicking off our events program for this year and particularly excited that it's such a dear friend um, and someone who I've worked with so closely behind that counter in the days when we could still touch each other. And we won't go into that story at this particular <laughs> point. How <laughs> touch we really did. Anyway, on that note. Um, for the people who are in the room here, there are toilets and um, they are just out there in the corner. So if you do need to use the toilet, you need to come down here and go out there in the, in the corner. And that's where they are. Um, of course, the bar is open so you can go and grab yourself a drink at any point, um, preferably not in the middle of the event, otherwise that would be rude. Um, and we're going to have a signing, but that signing is going to be outside tonight. So for COVID reasons, we're keeping everything out in the open tonight, which is great. We'll be able to send you uh, the book, post it to you if you pay for it, and um, it'll be signed. So that's really great. Or you can have it held here for you as well. Okay, that's my preamble. I think that we'll get this show on the road. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're living on in this area, the Yagara and Turrbal people, and pay my deepest respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And also I'd like to shout out to the elders of the country on which the Zoomers are Zooming in from. So all around Australia, you will be on Aboriginal land somewhere. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to your elders as well. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land, particularly on this day just after invasion day um, we'd like to make this very sincere acknowledgement um, and to suggest that maybe a date change would be great for next year thank you very much if anyone is listening out there um, so tonight it's my great pleasure to introduce um, well firstly Claire Christian to you all Claire Christian uh, tells stories she's a playwright author theatre maker and facilitator her first novel Beautiful Mess won the text prize in 2016 and was released in 2017 her play Lissa and the Freeborn Dames debuted at Le Boisch in 2008 and is published by Playlab she has had a, the great joy of directing Michelle um, in uh, the, the smash hit, great joy, I think it was, um, in the smash hit comedy Single Asian Females, which was Michelle's play. Um, and she is a member of the Mama's Boys Collective and is the writer and co-collaborator of their play Brothers Book Club. Her second novel, A Pleasure Seeking Queer Romantic Comedy, It's Been a Pleasure, Noni Blake, was released in 2020, launched by Michelle, I think, online <laughs> at Avid Reader. And um, that is at the counter if you didn't get to um, get that book and get it signed, that is here at the counter as well. So you can pick that up later. And um, Claire, did you want to introduce Michelle yourself or do you want me to do that for you? You can do it. I can do <laughs> it. <laughs> so Michelle Law is a great friend of Avid Reader as a writer, an actor, working across print, theatre, filmmaking, filmmaking and television. She wrote the smash hit play, Single Asian Female. It's such a, like, coincidence here. <laughs> <laughs> threads that bind us, um, which 
sold out um, seasons across Australia and was also staged in New Zealand. Her screenwriting work includes the SBS show Homecoming Queens, which she co-created, co-wrote and starred in. She also co-wrote the comedy book Shit Asian Mothers Say, and I think there might be a Asian mother sitting in the audience <laughs> <laughs> who might be able to quote you from that book at a later point. Welcome, Jenny. Um, and her brother, Benjamin, also in the audience tonight, um, re- uh, with her brother, she regularly contributes to Australian publications and anthologies. Anyway, um, that is the long introductions, but the short introduction is these are awesome people and we are so glad that they're here tonight. Everybody welcome Michelle and Claire. How do we talk to the people? <laughs> How do we do the thing? We did it, Claire. We did it. Um, welcome, hello, and so thrilled to be having this conversation, as you can tell by our by these Michelle and I are deeply intertwined and love each other very, very much. Our love affair started just around the corner a few it years ago. Deep. Having a coffee over a, on a blind date. It was. It was us being professionally blind dated <laughs> and being set up for Claire to direct my first play ever, my first long form theatre work. And um, she just got it from the start. And ever since then, we have been very loving collaborators. I think it's because we talked about poo, maybe. Oh, that makes sense. In the first 10 minutes. I knew you were one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to jump in. Hooray, congratulations. This is in the world. You have birthed a book child. Um, I adored this so much. And in many ways, it feels like it encapsulates you because it is obviously brilliantly written, um, golden storytelling. It is deeply reflective of how you feel about the world, um, not only about how you see it but how you want it to be. Um, it's a celebration of culture. It is searingly laughed out loud funny, as in, like, the first paragraph. <laughs> I was cackling. It is aesthetically beautiful. And it comes with stickers. Mm. Oh, stickers. No, the no. only way that this could be for you is if it came <laughs> with a like claw machine and everybody run a drawing on soft toy. Like that's uh, the only way. Yeah. Hi Grant, next time. Hi Grant, please say no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to start by reading your words to you, which is weird, because I think it's the perfect encapsulation to welcome everyone to this evening and to your book. It says, hello, if you are reading this right now, you're either an Asian woman interested in travelling, an Asian woman's relative, friend, colleague, who's trying to determine whether or not this book will make a worthwhile gift, it will definitely buy it, (laughs) or an older white gentleman interested in learning exactly which places Asian women are going to in order to procure one as a date (laughs) to your adult daughter's wedding in an effort to enrage your ex-wife. If you are the latter, Kindly close this book, cancel your forthcoming trip to Phuket and promptly walk into the ocean. Farewell. Welcome. My first question is I want to know where this idea came from, and obviously around creating a travel memoir in a moment in time when we can't really travel. Well, the story of its genesis, um, it was very lovingly sort of pitched to me, actually, by Heidi Grant, who have put together and are still putting together this amazing series called Girl's Guide to the World. So mine's the second in the series. Um, the first book is called Black Girls Take the World, and um, that author up on the notes here is Regina Wharton. Um, they've got a few more of the works that are coming out soon, um, one to anxious girls, um, you know, for disabled girls. So it's really targeting those marginalised demographics of women who haven't had a travel guide or a guide to living in the world before um, that specifically targets them and their life experience. Uh, so I was approached to write the Asian Girls um, Guide 
Um, and I was, I was told that it could be whatever I wanted it to be. So that was really incredible because uh, I had an idea from the beginning that I wanted it to be really accessible and conversational and, and, um, and have stickers <laughs> and have postcards and it just be a really beautiful and fun object to have in your house or to give to someone really lovingly. Uh, the process of writing it was really interesting because uh, I started writing it during the beginning of the pandemic. Mm. How ironic, a travel book during the pandemic. Uh, and I was in lockdown, the first lockdown in Sydney where I'm based now. Uh, and so um, that was me sort of alone in my apartment with my cat and um, just trying to write about travelling and remembering where I'd been in the world and hoping for future travels while I was in my room looking over a golf course in Marrickville <laughs> um, and, you know, sort of covered in food stains because I didn't have anywhere to go or see anyone. Um, so it was quite, I guess, in a way it sort of helped my mental health because it allowed me that level of escapism and allowed me that um, level of nostalgia when I was so physically confined um, and, and mandated to stay home. Um, so there were joys, absolutely, because I was able to reflect on these amazing trips that I'd had, but it was also painful in parts because it just really reinforced that I couldn't go anywhere. The book, it feels deeply nostalgic and um, of your own travel, like you say, and you share some incredible stories, what was it like dipping back into that kind of vault? And how did you go this one, that one, not this one? I started like I do with every long form project, which is sort of doing a big brain dump that I categorise afterwards because um, I find that helps me just get material out because I'm such a perfectionist that I've become paralysed by putting things on the page. And so I just spew everything out and then I figure it all out like a jigsaw puzzle afterwards because I love jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so for this book, I went through a catalogue of every single place and every city and town that I've been to in my life yeah. and then reflected on what stories stuck out to me and if they could be categorised. Mm -hmm. And then I had an amazing editor, Alison Hugh, who um, she was based in Australia for a while working as an editor, but she's um, Canadian. And so she's based in Canada now. And she was able to sort of rifle through all this material with me and, and help me categorise them into chapters and make them make a bit more structural sense. Um, but, yeah, it, it, was, it was sort of you know, a big process of killing your darlings because, yeah. you know, you have stories that you do want to share but they don't quite make the cut. What is one of the ones that you now wish <laughs> so we can have an insight? Oh, I think I'm sorry that it in there and meant to be there. I'm not. I don't quite regret the fact that things didn't make it in. But you know, stories that are great trips that I had with ex-boyfriends but mm -hmm. I don't want to quite reflect on because yes. uh, those relationships didn't end particularly well or um, you know personal stories about family and extended family um, things like going to buy son like pay respects to my um, grandparents ashes that are in Hong Kong um, things that I knew other people in the family might not feel comfortable with me sharing um, funny stories about my uncle's gun collection in Canada <laughs> that probably shouldn't be publicised besides this event, hello. <laughs> uh, but uh, the things that probably shouldn't be in print. Yeah, yes. With it, yeah, your name attached to it for exactly. it. Yeah. And just be, you know, uh, kicked out of the family. Yeah, yeah. please don't get kicked out of the family. Yeah. As you said, the book is divided into five chapters or sections. Um, travel companions, self-care, culture and food, work and privilege, and final tips. Mm. So like you said, your editor helped you to get there. Yep. Did you, were any of those sections ones that you knew wanted to be in there or it was kind of a process together of looking at all of that content that you had? I think it was a process of looking together. At first, I originally had family and friends as different chapters and traveling by myself as a different chapter. And she sort of said, let's make that an umbrella chapter of travel companions. Um, I knew that I really wanted to have health in there um, because I think um, the health of Asian women around the world um, 
we're often putting ourselves last. Um, I think culturally that's that's something that's instilled in you from a young age as an Asian woman. Um, and so for me, I really wanted to foreground mental health, especially, as well as physical health. So I chat to um, Sami Koike, who is the founder of Shapes and Sounds, and that's um, a social media platform that is all centred on Asian Australian health, uh, mental health, I should say. Uh, so that was a big chapter for me. Um, safety was really fun to write. Um, I was at, I chatted to uh, my cousin and her girlfriend. Uh, and elbows. Oh, huge. Elbows are our key weapon. Elbows. You need to know that I've never learned that. They're very um, strong parts of your body. Uh, they're both Taekwondo black belts. Yes. And so I felt like they were the right experts to talk to for that. Um, the whole book was really fun to write. I love chatting to Unique Steins about food because yeah. um, that really transported me back to street food in Thailand. Mm -hmm. The way she um, writes about food is just so mouth-watering and it feels so visceral. Um, but, yeah, I think in, in answer to your question, probably health was a big one for me. Yeah. The interviews are beautiful and there, there's one that features in most sections and you ask beautiful questions. So to make my job easier, I thought I would steal a question from each of your interviews mm -hmm. and ask you one of those. Okay. Let's do it to ask others. <laughs> um, so what is one of the most profound moments you've experienced travelling alone that you wouldn't have been able to experience travelling alone? I've travelled alone a lot and I write about this in the book and I think there's a real stigma attached to people, especially women, um, who travel alone because it's seen as quite sad or quite lonely. And I think there's a real difference between loneliness and being alone. I think loneliness is really heartbreaking and be, can be quite tragic, but being alone is, like, incredible. It's so liberating and freeing and you are beholden to no one but yourself. So I really recommend it um, and um, I really enjoy it. Uh, I, there's an anecdote about this in the book that I went to the Great Barrier Reef by myself <laughs> um, on a seaplane. <laughs> I went to Lady Elliot Island, which is the southernmost coral cay, and I chose that um, spot because there was an eco resort there. So they're completely self sufficient. They um, recycle their own water and waste, and you can only get there by seaplane, and there's less bleaching there. And it sounds really morbid, but I wanted to say goodbye to the reef. <laughs> <laughs> um, on my own terms by myself and I also <laughs> wanted to say goodbye to <laughs> <laughs> I also, you know, I feel like when you're from a particular country, you don't often go to yeah. tourist destinations that um, are local to you. And so I found it absurd that I was born and grew up in Queensland and I never been. Um, and I also wanted to say goodbye to a very significant relationship in my life. And so I went on this trip essentially to sort of grieve yeah. um, in private. And the worst thing was, was I ordered a little um, glamping tent just so I could be on my own. And then they upgraded me to a family suite. <laughs> so I was alone in this four bedroom <laughs> unit. And I was like, okay, this is just exacerbating things. And then the staff would come up to me and be, I think they thought I was um, not well mentally. And they were like, is it okay that you're alone? I see that you're alone. I think they thought I was going to do a Virginia Woolf and sort of walk into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> but I just sort of reassured them, like, you know, find I, your hat on the beach. Yeah, just <laughs> my hat and my towel and my no goodbye. Uh, but I sort of had this one moment um, where, because there are no lights there at all, except for what's in your tent, I just sort of went into this pitch black part of the beach and with a blanket and just looked up at the stars and I just sort of cried for about half an hour um, and that was really nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I put it on the Crown and Island, island um, looking up at the stars yeah. um, and that was really lovely and I, I could not have done that with anyone else because they probably would have thought I was not well, <laughs> which in retrospect I probably was <laughs> ideal date and where in the world would it be? Oh, I had to think about this one a little bit after we talked about questions. I think an ideal date for me, I, was, I really love flea markets and mm. food markets. Um, so probably um, a local food market, 
where it's really warm. So maybe in Asia, getting straight street food in the summertime. And then the flip side is maybe somewhere in Europe in winter time, going to like a Christmas market and getting like hot chocolate, um, all of that stuff. Romantic. Romantic. Um, when you're eating in public, you can just sort of fall to the floor. Yeah. Um, which I love. <laughs> you, you can. It's convenient. Yeah. You don't have to worry about looking um, nice yeah. you're on a holiday. Yeah. yeah, good. I love that. Why is it important for Asian women to put their own health first and foremost? Oh, I touched on this a bit before. Um, I really feel like there's a, a it's instilled in you from a young age culturally to really put your your own well being um, very at the very last, <laughs> uh, which I think in the long term isn't the healthiest thing um, because if you're not well, you can't be a caregiver to others or mm. provide fathers so I very much ascribe to the um, airplane safety uh, guidelines which is you know you strap on your oxygen mask first and then you help other people once you're safe yep. um, so for me I guess you know growing up with Asian uh, female role models in my life like my mom and my sisters you know you see that self-sacrifice throughout their life and you recognize that's a really noble thing to do but um, you know, if they prioritise themselves a bit more, not to not to blame them in any way, um, but it it would have been beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you talk a lot about the book wanting to fight against the stereotype that we see of Asian women, but also celebrate all of the glorious things about Asian women as well. Um, the goal for you in writing this work and who you were thinking of reading it, what was the, the intention for those? Oh, yeah, women. Women. Or women. It was, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wanted Asian women from all different cultural backgrounds, all different ages and religions um, to, to recognise a part of themselves in the book. I mean, the entire ethos around any kind of writing I do, and I do so many different types, you know, I write for screen, I write for stage, I write for prose. It's all driven, when I write about race and gender, about um, reinforcing that you, you matter in the world and that the world is also built for you. Um, and I think that's in huge part because I grew up feeling so isolated and lonely and as if I should sort of just disappear or be invisible because I had such a lack of representation. Or when there was representation, it was misrepresentation. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to create something that was an antidote to that. Um, I was a bookseller for 10 year, 10, almost 10 years in sort of um, commercial as well as indie sectors. And I guess like the travel section was something that I always overlooked. Yeah. I was never into it. I thought it was quite dry and boring. And then it wasn't until I started writing this book that I realised that was because most of the memoirs that you see in the travel section are written very, like, by very particular people. Mm -hmm. and they're often older and Caucasian and well off. And I'm like, well, I'm absolutely not going to have the same travel experience as you because I don't move through the world in your body. Yeah. Um, and so I, that's, you know, I also come from a very specific identity as well, and that's why I really wanted to give voice to a lot of the women that I interviewed. Um, they come from very different cultural backgrounds and, and life circumstances, and so I wanted to create um, a sort of a breadth of a reference point for readers mm -hmm. and, and something that they could um, see themselves in. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and that you do that in everything that you do. There's a quote that I want to read from your interview with Mithila. Uh, yeah, Mithila. Uh, Mithila, um, in the love dating and travel section. Um, and she says, now that I've found my voice, my backbone, I'm all about open communication. Um, and this very much reminded me of you and exactly what you had just said. Um, you keep using your voice, um, sometimes very publicly, to explore the things that you are thinking or feeling in the way that you want the world to be um, and to change the broken systems like how we had a travel memoir section written by mostly predominantly white cis men. Um, do you get braver or uh, as you keep doing it or do you just keep 
trudging <laughs> along because it's so important to you? I think I started off really brave, but then I became more resilient, and I think they're different things. Um, I think I started off braver because less people knew who I was. <laughs> um, and then as I became more well-known, um, when you're a woman of colour who has sort of some semblance of a public profile, people really want to destroy you. Um, and so I've had many experiences of that um, publicly and privately that have been quite painful. Um, and I think over the years, I've just managed to keep going because you don't make any of this creative work because it makes you money. <laughs> you know, you do it because you have a compulsion to do it. Um, and so for me, at the end of the day, I have a greater goal, and that's to sort of contribute to the work that already exists that's written by Asian women or Asian Australian women in particular, um, and to um, create some sort of legacy for younger generations because that's not something I had. And, like, at the end of the day, people will say really awful things about you and really try to ruin your life to the point where you feel physically endangered. <laughs> and that's not great. But at the end of the day, I think I have a really strong sense of who I am. Um, and I got that from my mum and, and my family as well. And I know that my work doesn't define who I am. Like, besides my work, I'm, you know, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend. Um, I'm a partner and I put a lot of value into those relationships and work is just like, you know, it's taken like a long time for me to get to this place, but work is like another element of that. And it already is paying off because you get emails from young Asian schoolgirls who are performing monologues from single Asian female or coming and seeing the show and talk, telling you what an impact you had. Um, so you're already, thank God you are doing it. Thank God you are building the resilience and being brave because I know that I need you and we all need you to be doing it. So high five, man. Oh, thanks. Okay, here we go. Do you have any <laughs> top tips? Are you gonna have a clipboard? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Do you have any top tips or general advice for staying safe while traveling? Your cousins do do you <laughs> and they do an exceptional job of they've got some great that. tips in the but box. I, I was curious about your Michelle oh. or Brandon top tips. <laughs> I'm a bit of a paranoid traveler. <laughs> I put that down to my mother telling me that anyone would pick coffee at any point in my life. <laughs> uh, um, one thing I do do uh, when I travel internationally is I buy a SIM before I go. Ah. So I go into eBay and I buy a local SIM so you can put it into your phone before you even land. And that saves you having to go to the local SIM place and pay, pay know, exorbitant amounts for a local SIM. Mm. And it means you're ordering, or automatically in touch with someone who knows where you are. Um, so that's something that I like doing. Um, I never stop to talk to anyone when I'm walking home at night mm. um, because uh, people can look quite innocent or, you know, want a particular thing and it feels rude um, but at the end of the day I'd rather look and feel rude than be potentially in danger um, and then if you're traveling with someone just always you know having a meeting point and get um, separated or telling the other person where you're going to be like if you're going out on a date with someone that night I'll be at this bar at this time yeah okay. that's the thing excellent tips what is your favourite food memory from your travels? Oh, my gosh, I have to go through my notes because there's so many. Yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> that's why your interview with Yumi is so gorgeous because she articulates exactly that. And she even gives tips for restaurants around the yeah. world, which is incredible, that she remembers. Uh, I think one of my favourite memories is when we went to Ipo in Malaysia when my mum was born and grew up. Um, and she took us to sort of local stalls where um, we got like freshly made rice stills, like whole fun with chicken and um, bahufa, which is like this 
being her dessert with um, sugar syrup. Um, and that was really, that was freshly made and it was like, what, 50 cents. <laughs> Um, so that's probably one of my favorite food memories. Um, and you know, just, and then just trashy stuff, <laughs> <laughs> like getting on a giri at a 7-Eleven in Japan, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that sort of stuff. Um, unexpectedly cool, cheap, good stuff. Yeah. There you go. How is this worth 50 cents? Exactly. <laughs> I think that with the best food overseas is the cheap stuff that yeah. the locals eat. I agree. I, yeah. I agree. And you know, you can go to a fancy restaurant anywhere. Mm. What is, uh, uh, who, uh, sorry, who are your female, um, it's your question. And I think I was like, yes, this is a great question. <laughs> who are your female Asian role models that you look up to? Um, definitely my mum. Yeah. Uh, she is a hectic. <laughs> she is an active Asian woman who you know, basically raised five children single handedly, yeah. um, and none of us ended up being assholes. Which is one like there's five of us, like there's yeah. a high <laughs> chance <be> one <laughs> in a mix of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so really proud of the job that she's done, um, in, especially migrating to a country where she'd never been before. Um, also, my older sisters. Um, Awesome Asian women in the arts in Australia, um, who are my mates, uh, so like Alice Pong, who's a novelist, um, Pauline Yao. Um, who else did I have? I'm Origin. really upset, got kicked off the job. Oh, absolutely robbed. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my best friend, Corey Chen, yeah. um, our friend, Courtney Stewart, who is in Single Asian Female. I really admire all of them and look up to them because. Um, they're all the arts do in sectors, in roles mm -hmm. where Asian women have been historically excluded and they're doing it awesomely, if not better, yeah. <laughs> than um, the people who've been doing it for decades and decades. Um, and I think they kick ass and it's scary. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and have the additional labour of having to tell the people who've been doing it forever. Oh, big time. Yeah, oh, I always think back to this anecdote Corey told me where um, she was directing a TV show and someone came up to her and asked if she was catering. <gasps> and she was like, eh, I'm going to find that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was incredible. Yeah, was incredible. <laughs> I love that. Um, can you tell us, speaking of deeply impressive Asian women, your team? Um, on this oh. for oh my all gosh. Asian women. I have never had that. I This is the first long-form project I've worked on where top to tail it was Asian women, the entire team. Yeah. And I've written down the entire list so I don't miss anyone. So my, edit my editor was Alison Q. My proofreader was Leong Su. My illustrator was Joey Long. The cover artist is Louise Jung, um, and the designer was EBO Studios. Uh, and it just made the process so pleasant <laughs> and streamlined. Uh, and I think a lot of that is down to the fact, especially between my editor, Alison, and I, there was just a real shorthand. Um, and she and I have talked about this a lot on you know, podcast episodes that just between ourselves, where you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to tiptoe. I think um, in the past when I've worked with maybe um, with white editors, there's a sense of fear of an apprehension of apprehension they don't want to say the wrong thing and don't want to offend you, which is fair enough. Um, and they also don't want to say anything not PC. So this removes all of that so you can just immediately get to the craft and just be like, this sentence does not fucking make sense. <laughs> Yeah. And just be like, thank you, Alison. Uh, or just, you know, can you clarify this for me about, you know, something to do um, with this particular culture? And I'm like, okay, good. We can just, like, get into the work. Yeah. Beautiful. What an incredible experience, which now I hope you can demand. <laughs> I, get more of. I think I will. I think I'll continue to. It's an precedent. Good. Keep going, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Because the only white person on the right. Your honorary. Well, your mum did tell me one of the greatest compliments I've ever had on being either single and female. She said, You must have Chinese blood. Yeah, you felt too. That was the best compliment I've ever had. So thank you, Mum. I want to 
ask you about oh, where's that question? Um, oh, I can't. So there are some incredible stories in here that you do go into detail, in, and then there are just some teasers. There are some sentences, throwaway sentences, and I can't decide if I want to know more about you and Corey, your best friend Corey, antagonizing. Mickey Mouse. We were antagonised by Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Or you fly kicking a man in the head in a nightclub. So <laughs> I will let you choose uh, which one can we get more uh, choosy across. I'll go with the fly kick story. Okay. I feel like there's a bit more to that. Okay. Um, it actually happened at Rick's in the Valley. This was back in what, 2008? Mm -hmm. And I'd gone out with a group of friends and one of the guys dancing on the dance floor just would not stop hitting on my friend and she kept repeatedly saying no. If I don't want to be, I don't want to be part of this, please leave me alone. It got to the point where I was just like, this is it. Like, I just got to put my foot down. So I kicked him really hard on the leg. <laughs> and it was so loud that I could hear him yelling, like through the music. And then um, it probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but then he started coming for me and then got tackled by security <laughs> and escorted out of Rick's. Um, and I never saw that man again. <laughs> and we do not wish him well. We do not wish him well. No, no means no. And I had to, to physically ask the teacher that. Good thing you don't have a black belt. Yes. Like your cousin, otherwise that could have gone into for Maybe, 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 maybe. Yes, I do have a history of hot headedness though when it comes to men. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was a pickpocket experience I had in Spain where these two guys were trying to steal my wallet and passport by pretending they were the police. Oh no. Yeah, and then halfway through the robbery, I was like, something's off. <laughs> And then I realized I was just wearing bombs. And um, they couldn't have a weapon, but they started walking, they started running away, and then I chased after <laughs> um, and I got my stuff back and then they ended up apologizing. <laughs> I said, give me my passport and my money back. Yeah. And then they were like, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Which I don't remember because I could have had a weapon, but it was also broad daylight. Um, uh, but I got my stuff back, and I, I, I think it also helps that they were a bit older. Um, and also, I don't think they expected that I would run after them because I think they preyed on Asian tourists before and they felt okay with it. And I was like, mm. <laughs> no, I want my 16 euros back. <laughs> Good. And the happy ending. It does. And hopefully they have rectified that behavior. Um, this book made me feel deep, deep like the lust for the world and for life. And so that is my question. Of what are you lusting after now in the world that we find ourselves in? But in the future, or what are you dreaming about and lusting after? Well, I think a lot of the questions that I've gotten about this book is, oh, sorry, why write a travel book during a pandemic? And I think for me, it's really important to have something to hope for. And I'm hoping for street food in Asia. Um, I'm really excited to go to South Korea for the first time because my brother and sister-in-law got married last year and they couldn't have their traditional wedding in Korea. Um, so we'd like to go and do that as a family. I'd love to go um, to Iceland. Um, and I want to go travelling with um, my boyfriend because we met during lockdown. So we haven't really seen anything except 6,000 city parks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than a, a city-based park. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we tried, We came to Queensland for Christmas and we had to be in isolation. So even then, we didn't go anywhere. <laughs> we saw our Brisbane park. Yeah, yeah, it's in my sister's backyard in yeah. South Brisbane, and that was right. nice. And you can't test a relationship until you've had gastro in a hotel okay. I think so. Any kind of relationship. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. 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 Um, we have zero doubt at all, collectively, I think all of us, um, that Asian women are going places. Where are you 
go into where what is next? What are you what are you working on? What are you what are you dreaming up and cooking up now? Oh gosh. Past or <laughs> um projects that are happening um currently are uh, I purchased the option to reference novel. I'm adapting that into a feature film. Amazing. Um, so that's an ongoing big project of mine. I've got a new play coming out this year that uh, will be announced soon. Um, yay! yay. Uh, Miss Peony was supposed to be on twice and then got cancelled twice because of COVID, so fingers crossed it will be able to be on next year touring along the East Coast of Australia, so Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney. Um, and then beyond that, I've, you know, I'm still, I've got lots of ideas for playing for a, a TV show that I want to write and some book series. Um, so I think that's in store. Um, I'm probably going to be focusing more on screen and, um, and, and literature in the short term. Beautiful. Yeah. I will read, watch, develop, <laughs> cry over, laugh at anything you create. Thank God that we have you in your words, in your brain. Giving, giving, gifting us joyous things like this. Um, Chrissy, yes. do we have any questions? That is a very good question. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the people who are here in real life? And um, anyone who is online, uh, we will take your questions and they will be texted to me oh. as I stand here. This is the, now. the magic, oh. the magic of Zoom across the inside outside of Avid Reader. So um, any questions, please feel free to, um, well, any, any questions from people in the, the audience today? I am actually um, wondering how much fighting it took to be able to get something so beautiful mm. made because even to get like little black and white pictures was like <laughs> a fight for my last book. So I just wondered, I know that you've got a representative <laughs> from your publishing no. industry. Do oh, this. Oh, oh, oh. I have had, they were terrible. No, I didn't say that. Marley <laughs> Grant has been such a dream publisher in every sense of the word. I mean, from the get go, when they brought the book idea to me, I was like, you've made this so easy for me. Um, um, and they also had a short list of illustrators and, and cover artists. Um, so we knew because it was a gift book, it was going to have a really heavy illustrative element. Um, I really wanted to have stickers and <laughs> postcards, and I had to decide the, between the two. And I was like, what are the stickers? <laughs> uh, so that was a non negotiable. <laughs> um, and they they were they pitched some names for me and I, I was able to choose a short list and I would I in terms of the cover art I'd always been a massive fan of Louise's work. I remember getting um, a Mecca gift box that she designed and just being like, who is this artist? So I'd never seen that sort of aesthetic and vibrancy before. And so when they said that she was designing the book cover, I just lost my mind. Yeah. Um, and so her work's gorgeous. Joey was an artist that I didn't know before, but whose work was introduced to me through Harley Grant. And I was like, she is incredible and has a real sense of offbeat, whimsical humour that really, I think, complements my writing. Um, and it's got this nice, beautiful little badge here that, it, that all of the Girls' Guide series books has, so you can identify which books they are. Um, so I really didn't have to fight much at all. And um, I didn't have many notes, and when I did have notes, all of the designers were so open mm -hmm. and, and came back with some really incredible options. I remember the book page. I was like, is there, is there a chapter in this? <laughs> this is something to do with, you know, um, Polish and Russian schools. So if you could, I could comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 
<laughs> Sorry, that was, that was the, last the event. Uh, TV series, The Principle. The last thing that E1 takes to me before this event. Um, does anyone else from here have a question for Michelle? Yes. Hi, Laura. Yes, so Laura was talking about the word place in the title and how um, it feels as someone who's coming back to this particular place, avid reader in the, in the engine, um, having come from here and, and sort of um, started my career in Brisbane and, and also in the shop as well. Um, it's, it's so meaningful and significant and I wouldn't have gotten up onto a plane during a pandemic for anything else really. <laughs> I mean, I had an N95 mask and a face shield on, but I was like, I'm going to have it. <laughs> and I got here and I was taking so many photos because it had changed so much um, since the time that I left it. Like these vines hadn't grown over um, across before when I left. Um, and this place is so special and important to me because not only myself, but also my brother and my sister had worked here before. So collectively, I think we've been part of this business for 10 years or so. Um, and it was always the place to try and get a job because it was so impossible. <laughs> and I remember applying so many times and then I finally got onto the events team and I would be the person setting up the sound system and all of this. So this is why it's a bit surreal to be here launching a book now. Um, and yeah, I, I started here uh, when I was in my early 20s and I just finished a creative writing degree at QUT. And it was just so invaluable being in an environment where you're constantly surrounded by not only your peers who are accomplished writers, but local writers who, who live in Brisbane. I remember just sort of doing a shift at Isabel Carmody would walk in <laughs> and then John Birmingham would be here. And I'd just be like, where am I? <laughs> uh, and then the calibre of international and national authors who would come in who you would just get to sit in and listen to them speak. Um, and, you know, that was part of your work. And I've never been able to work for a company unless I really believe in their values and their principles. And that's why I've always sort of struggled to find somewhere to work. But I was at Avid for almost five years. Um, and beyond that, I've only been able to work for myself. <laughs> uh, so I think that's a testament to Avid. <laughs> Um, and, and everything that um, the incredible team and, and Fiona and Kev really and Chris and the spearhead here. So it's really special and, and meaningful to be back here, particularly. We do miss having a law working at the counter. <laughs> like for ages, it was there was always got to be a law here. Like, is there another one that we can have? Yeah, like, maybe I'm pregnant with another one. Yeah. Like, oh, that seems impossible. <laughs> It's never to 14 years. I think that will go by in a flash. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Anyone has a question from the internet? Is it about Russia? <laughs> <laughs> no, but all it says is question from Jemima. So that's it. Mm. Thanks, Jemima. All right, we might wait for that one. It might be um, on its way out to me. We will ask Jemima's question in a second. Is there anybody else from here that has a question? Good. Uh, could you repeat that? Because the cool jazz was just not <laughs> holding music. Uh, the question was about, um, I guess. I guess growing up in this country, growing up in this environment, um, um, what advice would I give to young people who are facing similar challenges that I did and, and still do, um, especially considering the, the socio-political environment that we're living in right now? Do you think specifically in regards to like Asian people and Asian diasporas? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, gosh, what advice would I give? I mean, a large part of right, why I wrote the book was because, you know, it was the start of the pandemic and, and East Asian people in particular were being really vilified and there was a lot of anti-Asian racism around the world. You know, you had 
Trump talking about the China virus and the Atlanta spa shootings and then the attacks that were happening against students in Melbourne. Um, and they were disproportionately named on women, Asian women. Um, and for me, that just, it really reinforced to me that like anti-Asian racism in this country is so cyclical. Like, you know, it started when Chinese people came during the gold rush two centuries ago, and then it reinforced again with Pauline Hansen and the white Australian policy, and now it's come back again. It sort of feels like we're stuck in this loop. Um, in terms of advice, Gosh, it's so it's such a big question, uh, but I would say um, defining your community, whatever that might be, is really really important. Um, because I was born and grew up on the Sunshine Coast, and I was quite monocultural. Um, it was very like white cis heteronormative like environment, um, and you know, growing up in my family, we felt really out of place, and I faced quite. Um, overt racism from a very young age. Um, and I think that really informed my worldview. And I think for me, when I moved to Brisbane and met other Asian people, other people in the arts who were interested in the same thing, and then when I moved again to Sydney and met other people who were working in the same sphere, I felt like I could breathe for the first time. Like I didn't realise I'd been like holding my breath for such a really long time. Um, and it was a real sense of peace and, and safety. Uh, so I would really recommend um, trying to find your people of whatever they may be and, um, and knowing that you have that safety net. Um, also, you know, you, you make your own family as well because um, a lot of people aren't as lucky as others to have, you know, that strong family support. Um, I think also seeking out the work of people who, who share your identity uh, whatever identity that might be is really important because when I was at uni, I was taught predominantly white dudes and I thought in order to succeed as a writer, I needed to basically be the next Tim Bitten, which is, yes, I am a sub-renter. <laughs> uh, and, and it wasn't until I graduated and I unlearned all the things that I would learned. Like, you know, you have to learn the rules in order to unlearn them. And I started seeking out female writers, writers of colour, um, who were writing in, a, in sort of the comedy genre, the comedy voice, comedy space, and realised that that was a valid thing. Um, and I really felt like I discovered my niche, but that took a lot of, like, unlearning and, and um, a lot of work on my part. So, yeah, I think... Um, looking for the work that you admire that represents you is really helpful. Yeah, it made me feel a lot less lonely. So, yeah. How do you think um, young Luxella and Adam and Michelle would feel kind of glancing into the future of seeing this woman playing? I think she'd be really happy. I think I'm the type of person who's really hard on myself and I don't reflect on the things that I achieve because it's sort of like they get something done and then I'm like, what's the next thing? And then everyone's like, congratulations on the book. And I'm like, what book? <laughs> um, and um, I think the past Michelle is probably really proud of all the work that I've put in over the, like the self-work that I've put in over you know, the last decade of like being grateful for the things that I do have and um and really identifying what it is I actually want to do and what I find important as opposed to like comparing yourself to other people in the industry or like comparing yourself to your idol and just actually figuring out what makes you happy. Yeah. I've got that question from Jemima. Oh, Jemima. It was, it was a photo, so it took a while to get oh, down. Oh, a photo? Well, no, no, it's a photo of the question. Oh, okay. and I found it interesting noticing the privilege I had in a way while living in Malaysia because of my Australian identity. 
have you experienced something like this before traveling to non-western countries i found this interesting because i don't, don't notice the same kind of privilege having an asian identity in australia that's such a great question Joanna. i love it um there's a whole chapter in the book that is about work and, and privilege as someone who's part of the asian um, diaspora in the west um so i can absolutely speak um, from my experience which sounds really similar to your experience um i found it really discombobulating um going to hong kong as a teenager and sort of recognizing okay so this is where my parents migrated from and just seeing uh the relative extreme wealth we have in australia and as a middle class family that, that we were in you know having a house and, and having a yard and seeing my cousins who were fully grown adults living in a tiny room with bunk beds and um, trying to maintain romantic relationships and maintain healthy relationships with their parents despite the fact that you basically need to be a millionaire to move out of home to Hong Kong. Um, so that was really uh, an uncomfortable sort of realization. And then um, traveling to countries that are a bit less developed than Australia um, in Asia and recognizing. And locals trying to speak to you because you might look like a local, but you don't speak the language or actually from there. And the sense that you really have that privilege um, and you need to know how to wield it in ways that are responsible and ethical. Um, because when you, you talk about privilege, we often think of, you know, those white dreadlocked dudes in Asia who are like, me, I'm so much, I'm going to trip. And you're like, it's like, oh my god, just walk into the scene now. Um, but you don't often interrogate it in yourself. And, you know, absolutely, as like settlers in Australia, you realise, like, you know, this isn't our country and we're living on stolen land. And I don't quite belong in this country either. And so the sort of always wrangling with like privilege that you have in both instances that aren't quite the same, but are privileged nonetheless. And so it's a constant, um, it's a constant negotiation of you trying to do the right thing in each circumstance. Yeah, that's a really that's really interesting. I think that will be a great chapter for people to look at <laughs> and, and this is a nice time to remind you that we are talking about the book asian girls are going places which is so beautiful and if you do are at home listening and haven't got a copy you can call us pay for it and get it signed to you and we will either send it to you or hold it here so um we we would have some time for one last question before we go to our signing. Does anybody have a final question for Michelle? Nobody? I think it's time for the signing. <laughs> <laughs> we have been amazing listening to the both of you talk. It's great to have friends like this have a conversation where we feel like we're just like sitting in around the corner of West End Coffee House having that coffee with you when you first met. You guys are awesome. You're awesome. It's really, really good. So thank you to Claire. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. to have Michelle back just for this one moment and um, do grab her now to get your signature because who knows when the border will be closed again and we won't be able to see it for a while so it'd be really great to get your copy and if you have anyone you know who is a friend who might be interested in the book now is the time to get your signed copy thank you everybody <laughs>